Hey, 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 Med School Made Easy here with another video. Today we'll be talking about pulmonary embolism, uh, pulmonary emboli, and their three uh, subcategories. Those three subcategories, without further ado, are massive, submassive, and non massive. Uh, now, when you're getting a consult from the ER or you're consulting someone from the ER, you'll say, I have a patient down here with a submassive PE, and we're going to go into more on what that means. Now, usually when someone comes in, you have a clinical suspicion for pulmonary emboli, like, uh, you know, they have a history of DVT, a history of PE, some sort of hypercoagulable state, dyspnea, chest pain, pleuritic chest pain, uh, you know, inability to keep their saturation up, etc. Um, you'll do this workup and that workup will usually include a chest x-ray um, and then depending on your patient you go into your more advanced more expensive uh, modalities like uh, CTPA or a pulmonary angiogram uh, it's kind of the gold standard these days um, otherwise you might do things like an echocardiogram an EKG um, and maybe even a VQ scan if you're old school or the patient can't take contrast etc uh, in any case so a massive one right that's the one that is easy to remember because that means they're hemodynamically unstable, hemodynamic instability, right? Uh, that is tachycardic, hypotensive, uh, very labile, uh, inability to keep their saturations up, and they're really sick, right? This is like the huge saddle pulmonary embolus that you need to treat right now. Um, we'll talk about the treatment of that in a second. Um, Non-massive is like your little subclinical incidentally found PE, right? So someone came in and... Uh, they scanned their chest for a different reason and they found this, or um, you know, maybe someone comes in with pleuritic chest pain and dyspnea, but their vital signs are normal and their heart looks normal. So hey, that's just a, this is kind of like a norm, I'm gonna say it's a normal uh, PE. But what that really means is um, like subclinical, like uh, normal vital signs, okay? You know what I'm trying to say there. It doesn't mean that they don't have any symptoms. It just means that um, this isn't necessarily a PE that you know you need to do thrombolysis or something like, or another procedure for. They just need to be on anticoagulation. Um, and then this last one, submassive. So this is one that people screw up the most, especially our new interns. They've never heard of this or they can't describe it accurately. And what this means is there's evidence of right heart strain uh, seen on different diagnostic modalities. Okay, and what that means is. The pulmonary embolism is in the is in the lungs and it's preventing the pulmonary artery coming from the right ventricle, the right heart, from getting blood there effectively. So it's like causing a, a clog in the system, it's causing pressure to back up, right? Um, what happens there is normally the right heart is a pretty low pressure system, but um, if you stress it like that and you make it squeeze harder, you can show signs of what we call right heart strain, all right? Right heart strain is what defines a submassive uh, PE. Um, uh, right heart strain can manifest in a couple different ways. Um, you can see it on an echocardiogram. You look at the right ventricle to left ventricle ratio, okay? And if that's greater than 0 0.9, or if you see equalization of chamber size or flattening of the uh, ventricular septum or something on ultrasound, aka echo, that um, lets you know that the right heart is dilated and it's working too hard, right? It has to squeeze too much blood out because there's this clog in the system downstream. So that'd be one way. Another way, and this is the easy way that you, know, you usually kind of see it first, is your enzymes will take a bump. So you get your, you know, everyone gets their rainbow labs when they come into the uh, ED. So they'll have um, troponinemia, um, they'll have elevated uh, 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 BMP, that's what I'm sorry, I was blanking on it. Um, CKMB, um, things like that. You, you might also see like an elevated D-dimer, which isn't very, um, you know, uh, it's very sensitive, not very specific. Uh, but in any case, you see elevated enzymes. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, much talked about rarely seen EKG changes. The classic one is um, S, uh, S1, Q3, T3. Um, you might see on your EKG leads. Um, those are really the big... Uh, signs. Another thing you might see on like a contrasted CT scan is uh, what we call hepatic vein hepatic vein reflux 
And what that means is normally on a, um, you know, on a negative contrasted angiogram of the pulmonary vasculature, you won't see contrast in the hepatic veins, right? Because all the contrast is going in one direction, and that's to the left heart, and then systemically, and it gets diluted out before it gets back to the liver. Uh, if you have a clot in the pulmonary vasculature, it causes this dilation of the right ventricle, causes backup in the right atria, causes backup in the IVC, et cetera, um, you then get that contrast refluxing back in the hepatic veins. So if you get a CTPA, uh, one of the easiest ways to look and see is, you know, look at your chamber sizes on the CT scan, look and see if they look about the same size. Um, uh, the other thing would be look at the liver. And if you see contrast lighting up the hepatic veins, you know, you have evidence of right heart strain. So why is this clinically important? Who cares? Um, for massive PEs, these are the people that are hemodynamically unstable. This is where you would consider lytics, right? Like thrombolytics, or um, embolectomies, some high speed centers have uh, pulmonary embolectomy teams and things like that. Um, classically, this is when you would consider TPA, okay? And the dose, th this will depend on who you ask, but for the sake of this video, usually in an emergent situation, we give 100 units uh, as the dose for TPA. Um, for submassive, these are the people you really have to look at the patient. So if it's a young, otherwise healthy, uh, you know, 20 something year old um, with an undiagnosed hypercoagulable state or something else, um, this is where you want to con uh, consider like catheter directed thrombolysis, right? Like an ECOS catheter or uh, consulting your vascular surgery team um, to see if they want to try and go after this embolism. Uh, for non-massive, this is again, you, you just need to anticoagulate them. Uh, three to six months, depending on which guidelines you look at and, uh, and depending on if this is their first or second or whatever, uh, provoked or some provoked, et cetera. Um, and, and really what we're trying to do with all these different treatment, what, the reason why we care about PEs and why they become clinically significant is if it goes untreated, like let's say you have a submassive PE with evidence of right heart strain and you're like, ah, they'll be fine and just give them some, uh, you know, Xarelto, Lovenox or whatever and we'll see you in six months type deal, is that um, this right heart strain can lead to uh, right heart hypertension, right? And that's an irreversible, kills your heart type process. That's like core pulmonology, that's like elevated pressures in your right heart system. That's like, that's no bueno. And that, that is why we treat PEs, especially the submassive um, ones. So massive, it's easy. You're trying to keep the person alive. Non-massive, it's easy. You just got to anticoagulate them. And submassive, you really got to think about treating them uh, to prevent that, um, you know, right heart strain leading to right heart failure um, and right heart hypertension. Uh, all right, that is PEs and their three types in a nutshell.